Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my in-depth review of Canon's RF 100-500mm, a long telephoto zoom for the full-frame EOS R mirrorless system. This video delves into the performance and quality of the longest-reaching RF zoom to date, and in particular how it compares to the older EF 100-400mm, which you can of course adapt very successfully to EOS R bodies, and from this point on, when I mention this lens, I'm talking about the latest Mark II version. Officially announced in July 2020, the RF 100-500 cost US$2,699 or €2,899, British pounds, making it $400 or £600 more expensive than the earlier EF 100-400, so let's find out if it's worth spending the extra. Like my other reviews to date, this video is sponsored by you, dear viewer, so if you find any of it useful, the best way to support me is with a like and a follow, so if you haven't already subscribed, come on, please give that button a click. Thanks, now on with the video. Before anything else, I updated my 100-500 and EOS R5 body to the latest firmware available at the time of testing, and this resolves some early issues with stabilization that's been reported. So all of the results that I'm going to show you in this video were using version 1.1.1 for the R5 body and 1.0.7 for the lens. Be sure to update your body and lens to the latest firmware versions. Okay, so here's the new RF 100-500 on the left, joined by the EF 100-400 on the right, and the first thing you'll notice is just how close they are in length. 208mm for the RF versus 193 for the EF when both are fully retracted, making the new lens only 15mm longer. But once you add the adapter to mount the EF lens on an EOS R body, the combination actually becomes a little bit longer than the native RF version. But the take home here is both will occupy roughly the same space in your bag, despite the new model zooming 100mm longer. Once you pick them up though, you'll notice a bigger physical difference is the build material. The older EF 100-400 has a mostly metal barrel versus mostly engineering plastic on the RF model. Now this is no different to other high-end EF versus RF lenses, and while you may assume that metal is superior, modern plastics may actually perform better. Now I've not dropped or banged either lens, so I can't say whether one is more resilient than the other, but Canon's adopted engineering plastics for all of its RF lenses so far without complaint. The change of materials allows the 100-500 to actually weigh a little less than the 100-400, even more so when you take the adapter into account, plus it's less cool to the touch, which could be a benefit in very cold conditions. Both lenses are weather sealed, including rubber grommets at the lens mounts, and both are also supplied with padded, zippable carrying cases. The RF 100-500 features four rings on the barrel starting with the customizable clicky control ring closest to the mount, followed by a fairly narrow but smooth manual focusing ring. Like other RF lenses, there's no focus distance markings on the barrel as these are instead displayed graphically in the viewfinder or on the screen. On the other side of the controls is a twistable ring to adjust the stiffness of the zoom. Like the similar ring on the earlier 100-400, this is more of a clutch than a lock, still allowing you to zoom even at the stiff position, but reducing the risk of creep when the lenses are pointed straight up or down and the barrel slowly retracts or extends under its own weight. Now mechanisms inevitably loosen over time, but even when set to the loosest position, my 100-500 sample didn't suffer at all from creep. Meanwhile, at the end of the lens is a large zoom ring which extends the barrel by 90mm, and the filter thread remains 77 like other Canon L lenses, it's supplied with a hood, and this one includes a sliding window, allowing you to turn circular polarizing or variable ND filters. Coincidentally, like the RF 70-200, the hood is coloured white, like the high-end EF Super Telephotos, while a rubber coating around the outer rim allows you to stand it upright with less chance of slipping. The lens is also supplied with a fully removable tripod collar and foot, which allows the barrel to rotate freely within. Great for switching to the portrait orientation without removing the setup, although I do wish Canon made clearer marks on the barrel or perhaps provided a click to better confirm those 90 degree intervals. For comparison, here's the EF 100-400 mounted to the SR5 via the Canon adapter, pushing the body further away from the tripod mounting. Notice the absence of the RF control ring and the tapered style of the focusing ring. Meanwhile, the lens extends by 77mm when zoomed to the longest focal length, and Canon supplies this model with a black hood, again with a filter window, but lacking that rubber coating on the end. The tripod collar is a little different too, with the collar and a basic foot permanently mounted to the lens, adding to its weight, although the lower foot portion can be removed. As I turn the camera to portrait, you'll also see the focus distance window on the lens. This model doesn't support the digital scale on the EOS R cameras. 
Taking a closer look at the control panel of the RF100-500, you'll see essentially the same four switches as the 100-400, with a focus limiter of 3 meters to infinity, and the choice of three stabilization modes. Mode 1 stabilizes in all directions all of the time. Mode 2 attempts to recognize panning and disable stabilization at right angles to the panning direction, while Mode 3 works like Mode 2 but only corrects at the point of exposure and therefore may be better suited to tracking erratic subjects. As always it's a case of experimenting, I actually ended up sticking with Mode 1 most of the time even for panning when following birds in flight as I found the stabilization beneficial when initially composing at these longer focal lengths. To test the stabilization, here's the view with the RF100-500 on an EOS R5 at 500mm with all stabilization disabled, where the view is understandably very wobbly, and now with the IS switch on the barrel enabled. This is mode 1 that you're looking at, and like all Canon lenses with IS on the R5 and R6, it uses a combination of sensor shift, that's IBIS, and optical stabilization. Note the plus symbol next to the hand icon indicating that this is Canon's best IS technology in action, although the length at 500mm means you're unlikely to enjoy absolute locked on steadiness when handheld. In terms of effectiveness for still photos, Canon claims the lens is good for 5 stops of compensation on unstabilised bodies like the R and RP, or 6 stops when used alongside IBIS on the R5 and R6. In my tests I needed a shutter speed of at least 500th of a second to hand hold a sharp result at 500mm without stabilisation. In mode 1 I enjoyed perfectly sharp results at a 60th of a second and very good results as slow as 1 8th of a second, giving me 3 to 6 stops of compensation in practice. I'll show you how it looks for video later on. And just briefly here's the control panel on the EF100-400. When adjusting these switches you'll notice the cooler touch to the metal barrel of this model. Ok that's enough of the physical tour, so now let's see what these lenses can do in practice. To illustrate the range of the RF100-500 in action, here's a landscape filmed in 4K HQ using the R5 at 100mm before zooming into 500mm, allowing you to get close to distant details. To compare the range against the EF model, here's the RF100-500 again as a still photo taken at 100mm, and now for the EF100-400 also at 100mm. Now don't always assume that the same quoted focal length on two different lenses will actually deliver the same coverage in practice, but when focused on a distant subject these two lenses are sharing essentially the same field of view when set to 100mm. Now for the EF100-400 at 400mm, its longest focal length, followed by the 100-500 at 500mm where it's obviously capturing a tighter field of view. If you scale the first shot, you'll see the new lens is indeed delivering 25% tighter coverage as you'd expect, so the practice thankfully confirms the numbers. Of course there's nothing stopping you from just cropping into the 400mm shot to deliver the same field of view as 500, but you'd obviously be left with fewer pixels to play with. On the EOS R5, the resolution of uncropped images starts at a maximum 45 megapixels, but falls to around 28 megapixels when you crop a 400mm image to match a 500mm field of view. Now that's a big reduction, but on high-res bodies there's still loads of detail remaining. I mean, there's nothing wrong with 28 megapixels, right? On the left is a closer look at the 100-500 at 500mm, and on the right is the 100-400 at 400, but cropped and enlarged using Final Cut in the edit. Now obviously the shimmering from heat over this kind of distance reduces the potential quality of both results, and it's another factor to consider when shooting over distances with long lenses. But while the native 500mm on the left is resolving finer detail, the scaled result on the right still looks pretty close. If you want even more reach from the RF100-500 you can fit either the RF 1.4x or RF 2x teleconverters, extending the longest effective focal length to 700 or 1000mm respectively. Annoyingly though, the teleconverters will only work when the zoom is set between 300 and 500mm as the rear elements physically get in the way at shorter focal lengths. You won't even be able to mount the teleconverters unless the zoom is set to at least 300mm and once fitted, you won't be able to zoom wider without first removing them. That's something to think about when transporting this combination. If you want even longer than 500mm in the native RF mount, how about the RF600 or RF800mm, a pair of extending telephoto prime lenses with fixed f11 focal ratios. Now they're optically dimmer and lack the ability to zoom, but they provide greater reach at a much lower price and they'll also work with the teleconverters, albeit in a reduced autofocus area. 
The extra reach of the RF100-500 is a key benefit it has over the EF100-400, but inevitably comes at the cost of a dimmer aperture at the long end. I made this diagram to illustrate where the two lenses vary their apertures with the EF100-400 in the top half and the RF100-500 in the lower half. As you can see, the EF100-400 operates at f4.5 up to 135mm before closing to f5 between 135mm and 312mm, then to f5.6 between 312 and 400mm. Meanwhile, the RF100-500 offers its maximum f4.5 aperture up to 151mm, then closes to f5 up to 254mm, then to f5.6 up to 363mm, then to f6.3 up to 472mm, before reducing to the minimum of f7.1 up to 500mm. Now there's plenty of overlap between these two lenses, but while the newer RF model maintains f4.5 for a little longer, it begins to slow down much sooner. That said, at the long end, the RF version only misses out on f5.6 beyond 363mm versus 400 on the EF, so it's not a huge compromise by any means. In terms of optical construction, the RF100-500 employs 20 elements in 14 groups with 9 aperture blades and a closest focusing distance of 90cm when set to 100mm or 1.2m when zoomed all the way to 500 Compare that to the EF100-400 Mark II which employs 21 elements in 16 groups, has the same 9 aperture blades, but will focus down to 98cm at any zoom setting. So if you're into close-ups, the newer RF model will focus a tad closer when both are 100mm, but forces you to move a little further away as you zoom it to longer focal lengths. That said, the ability to zoom to 500mm compensates for the overall magnification as I'll now illustrate. Here's the older EF100-400 fully zoomed into 400 from its closest focusing distance of 98cm and now for comparison here's the RF100-500 from the same distance but only zoomed to 270mm which is the most you can zoom and still have a focused image from this distance. Coincidentally both lenses were working at their maximum aperture of f5.6 at these focal lengths. So from 98cm away the EF100-400 delivers greater magnification, but if you position the RF100-500 back to 1.2m and zoom into its longest focal length, you'll actually achieve fractionally greater magnification. Canon quotes 0.33 times for the maximum magnification on the RF model and 0.31 times for the EF version, which is as good as a draw in this regard. And while the 100-500 aperture drops to f7.1 when it's at 500mm, it is delivering more circular bokeh blobs here, which may be preferred. Now you may not think about using long focal length zooms for macro shooting, but many provide excellent close-up capabilities and from a distance where you're less likely to disturb insects or cast shadows on the subject. These are a selection of close-up images I made with the RF 100-500 at 500mm from its closest focusing distance of 1.2m, where again it will roughly match what's possible with the EF 100-400 when it's at 400mm from its slightly closer minimum distance. If you have either of these lenses, do give close-up photography a try, it can be really effective. Returning to bokeh blobs, here's a sequence with the RF100-500 at 100mm from 98cm, starting at its maximum aperture of f4.5 and gradually closing to f11, although the minimum at 100mm actually goes down to f32. The blobs are a little elongated into cat's eyes at the largest apertures and have subtle outlining, but there's no onion ringing and on the whole, the rendering is fairly attractive. Here's the RF100-500 on the left and the EF100-400 on the right, both at 100mm, 4.5 and shot from 98cm. There's some very subtle differences between them if you look really closely, but nothing to recommend one over the other here. As another comparison, here's a portrait shot with the RF100-500 at 100mm f4.5, where you can see the kind of background blur that's possible. It's never going to be huge at f4.5, but there's a little subject separation. And for comparison, here's the same view with the EF100-400, again at 100mm 4.5, where a minor rotational difference aside, they look pretty similar once more. If you want more significant background blur for portraits at 100mm on either lens, you'll need a greater distance behind you, like this shot by the beachfront in Brighton. I'm squinting a little here as the setting sun is shining right into my eyes, and I'll turn the camera onto this sun in just a moment. If you can step back a great deal, you could even attempt to portrait at 500mm, and while it's not exactly practical, this is what you'll get at 500mm f7.1, again, when the background is very distant. 
Okay, before showing you more examples of what you can do with the 100 to 500 range, let's take a quick look at the focusing speed. You're watching the 100 to 500 focusing here on the EOS R5 with a single AF area at 500mm f7.1 where the dual nano USM motors do the job very swiftly and confidently. They're really quiet too. For comparison, here's the EF100-400, adapted onto the EOS R5 and set to 400mm f5.6. The focusing can still be fast, but not quite as snappy as the native RF lens, and a little less consistent too, sometimes slowing down as it finds the target, and very occasionally hunting in the wrong direction before correcting itself. Now don't get me wrong, it's still very usable, it's just not quite as fast and confident as the native RF model. Returning to portraits, but of the more wild kind, here's a few of Steven Siegel, first at 100mm f4.5, where, like my portrait earlier, there's some potential for blurring if the background is far enough away. And now a couple at 500mm f7.1, where it's possible to much more easily isolate the subject. Wildlife photography is one of the core uses for lenses like these, and the R5 and R6 make it really easy with animal eye detection keeping the subject focused, but static birds are easy, so how about some birds in flight? For these sequences, I used the RF 100-500mm on the EOS R5, mostly at or close to 500mm f7.1. The camera was set to face and eye tracking across the entire frame with animal selected for the subject type. The R5 was also set to servo for continuous autofocus and the burst speed to H+. Note that the R5 and R6 require a decent level of battery charge to achieve their top speed of 12 frames per second, so I made sure I was topped up before shooting. The top speed is confirmed when the H plus icon is green. Once the battery level drops below a certain point, it'll turn white to indicate a slower speed. Oh, and in terms of the shutter type, this was the electronic first curtain. The R5 and RF 100-500 are a powerful combination for birds in flight, and the extra reach of the long end is always welcome for this kind of subject. At 500mm it can be tricky to initially position an erratic bird on the frame, but once the R5 recognises the subject, you'll rarely need to worry about the focusing, even if the bird moves towards the corners, a key benefit of on-sensor autofocus systems over DSLR viewfinders. That said, the relatively broad depth of field from the f4.5 to 7.1 aperture means backgrounds can become less blurred than you might desire, which in turn can make it a harder job for the autofocus system to lock on compared to using brighter lenses, especially with busy scenery in the background like Brighton Seafront. But that's an issue facing all lenses of this class. The bottom line is I scored a high percentage of keepers with this lens. Long telephoto zooms are also ideal for sports and action, so I headed to Hove Lagoon to photograph some wakeboarding. Once again, I found I could rely on the R5's face and eye tracking across the entire frame to find the subjects and keep them sharp even when approaching quickly. I love that the best of the modern autofocus systems have now become sufficiently reliable for action wildlife shooters to often dispense with manually positioned autofocus areas and simply rely on subject recognition instead. It allows not just for faster acquisitions, but the chance to more easily position subjects near the edges or corners. 500mm is just about sufficient for surf photography from the shore, especially if the camera has bonus pixels for additional cropping. These are all uncropped straight from the camera, again simply using face detection to lock onto the approaching subject. This proved fairly reliable in this scenario, although if the face became obstructed, the camera would inevitably prioritise on the sail. It did at least avoid focusing on the closer waves most of the time, making it easy to grab large numbers of decent images. It also worked pretty well for video, and I'll show you some examples in just a moment. Long lenses may be primarily aimed at sports and wildlife, but can also deliver unique perspectives on landscapes and urban scenes. These were a few that I took around Brighton at the longer end of the range. Long focal lengths are also perfect for solar and lunar photography, so here's a few of the setting sun at 500mm, and again all of these are uncropped. And now here's the moon at 500mm, first uncropped, but I can't resist zooming in for a closer look at those craters. If you'd like to get into moon photography, check out my tutorial all about it. Before moving on to video and then my final verdict, I wanted to show you how the quality of the RF 100-500 compares against the EF 100-400 in terms of sharpness across the frame at various focal lengths. Let's start with the RF 100-500 at 100mm f4.5 where it's delivering very crisp details across the frame even wide open. As you move into the corners there's no softening to mention. There's minor benefits to closing it down but it's really very usable wide open. But now here's a close look at the older EF 100-400 also at 100mm 4.5 on the right and it looks pretty good too. There's a minor reduction in contrast here but that's actually down to the lighting conditions changing a little so I'm going to call it a draw at 100mm. 
Next, here's the RF 100-500 at 200mm, where the maximum aperture reduces to f5. Taking a closer look again reveals excellent detail across the frame and no softening in the corners to mention, even at the maximum aperture. But here again is the EF 100-400 on the right, again at 200mm f5, where again it's essentially delivering the same degree of detail, albeit with minor variations on the lighting. And now the RF 100-500 at 400mm, where the maximum aperture becomes f6.3. Taking a closer look tells the same story as before with sharp details within the depth of field. At these kind of longer focal lengths, rising heat in the atmosphere becomes an issue when evaluating resolution, but it's still clear that the lens is delivering great results. But guess what? Yep, the EF 100-400 on the right also looks great at 400mm, where it additionally has the benefit of a slightly brighter maximum aperture of f5.6 versus f6.3. Of course, that's where the comparison has to end, but for completeness, here's the RF 100-500, now at 500mm, where the maximum aperture drops to f7.1. As you take a closer look, the effect of rising heat becomes ever more apparent, but again the potential definition is clear. So after examining a wide range of shots across the full range of focusing distances and apertures, I can confidently say the RF 100-500 is capable of delivering excellent results, but as you've seen, so is the older EF 100-400 Mark II. Just before my verdict, I wanted to show you a few videos I filmed with the RF 100-500 on the EOS R5, starting with a face tracking demo at 100mm 4.5, where Canon's face recognition and dual pixel autofocus effortlessly follows me as I move back and forth and in and out of frame. Canon really are very good at this. Prefer videos of birds? Ok, here you go, with the R5's autofocus system switched from human to animal, after which it locked onto Steven's eyeballs while filming. Right, how about those sunsets again at 500mm, but with the benefit of motion? I know some photographers are strictly stills only, but I love shooting a mix of photos and video. These and the bird shots were also entirely handheld, showing off the stabilisation in action. In fact, here's a quick before and after for handheld video filmed at 500mm, first without stabilisation, and now with it stabilised. Again, this uses a combination of optical and sensor shift where available, and while it lacks the eerie lock-on of the best image stabilisation systems out there, I'm looking at you Olympus, it's still steady enough for very usable handheld footage. Where the R5 and RF 100-500 really come into their own for me though, are when filming slow motion video in 4K. So here's a selection of clips for your viewing pleasure that I filmed in 4K at 100p, slowed by 4 times onto my 25p timeline. All of these were handheld. And finally, just for fun, here's the moon once more at 500mm, from a tripod this time, but filmed in 8K video on the R5. 
This means there's sufficient pixels to punch in by two times on my 4K timeline here for an effective focal length of 1000 millimeters. Not bad, huh? Now, if your timeline is 1080p or you don't mind a reduction in detail, here it is punched in again by a further two times for an effective focal length of 2000 millimeter. And when comparing frame grabs from 8K video with 45 megapixel stills from the R5, they also shared the same degree of detail, at least in the widescreen video shape. And since I've now taken you to the moon and back twice, there's nothing more to add before my final verdict. The RF 100-500mm continues Canon's approach of adding something new to classic EF lenses rather than simply rebuilding them with a similar spec and a native mount. The RF 70-200-2.8 is impressively shorter than the EF version. The RF 15-35 zooms a little bit wider than the EF 16-35 while also including IS. And now the RF 100-500 reaches further than the EF 100-400 while occupying much the same space in your bag and actually weighing a little less. In each case, the previous EF models remain excellent performers, but by adding something new to the RF versions, Canon compensates somewhat for their higher prices. In my test, the RF 100-500 delivered sharp results across the frame, throughout the focal range and with the aperture wide open. Sure, it wasn't any sharper than the EF 100-400 Mark II in my test, but that's a stellar lens, and the new model maintains this standard while reaching 25% longer. I love that you're getting this boost in reach with a lens that's barely longer in actual length and actually lighter, while the rubber tip lens hood, fully removable tripod collar and of course the custom RF control ring are all nice additions. What's not to like? Well, teleconverters will only work when the zoom is set between 300 and 500 mil, which is going to be inconvenient for transportation because that barrel is going to be extended. The f4.5 to 7.1 focal ratio isn't going to deliver the shallowest depth of field effects, but that's par for the course for this kind of lens and the rendering looks fine to me. The closest focusing is beaten by the 100-400 at the long end, but is compensated by the longer focal length. And the issues reported by some early owners regarding an IS wobble under certain conditions appear to have been resolved with a firmware update, at least for my examples. The biggest issue, beyond the teleconverters, is really the higher price. Compared to the EF 100 to 400 Mark II, you're getting similar quality, but with the benefits of zooming 100 mm further, having slightly faster and more confident focusing, a fully removable tripod collar, custom control ring, and slightly lighter weight. On the downside, it's also around $400 more expensive and can't zoom between 100 and 300 if you have a teleconverter fitted. If you don't already own the EF 100 to 400, I'd say it's worth spending the extra on the RF model, but existing owners will probably remain satisfied with what's already an excellent lens. If you're looking for a cheaper option though, there's a number of alternatives. In the native mount, you can actually reach further with Canon's RF 600mm and RF 800mm, which may be optically dimmer at f11 and of course don't zoom, but you could buy them both and still save $1000 over the 100-500. If you're happy to adapt, you could look out for a second-hand EF 100-400, remember to look out for the Mark II version, or consider one of the many third-party options from companies like Sigma. Their 100-400mm is an excellent performer and is around one-third the price of the RF 100-500. There's loads of options out there, although I'd also love it if Canon considers producing a more affordable 200-600 to range, like Sony has sometime in the future, as that's a great length for sports and wildlife. Ultimately, the RF 100-500mm becomes the best overall long telephoto zoom for the EOS R system and will delight sports and wildlife photographers. Like other RF lenses, it's unapologetically high-end with a price tag to match, but brings genuine advantages over the already excellent EF 100-400mm. If your budget will stretch, it comes highly recommended, especially to owners of the more recent EOS R bodies who can use it to really exploit their improved autofocus and burst capabilities. Right, that's it for another lens review. Cool, they involve a lot of work. If you found any of it useful, the best way to support me is to give it a like and to follow my channel. It's so easy to enjoy a video, but move on afterwards without realizing you never subscribed. But believe me, it really helps. And if you're feeling extra generous, how about treating yourself to my in-camera photography book, grabbing some Camera Labs merchandise perhaps, or how about shouting me a coffee? There's links to do all of this, along with checking the latest prices on the lens in the description and pinned comment below. So let me know what you think. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.